Hello, today is Wednesday, April 8th, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing today? Welcome to our show, and we have a great show in store for you today. We're very fortunate to have psychologist turned explorer and documentary maker Greg Little with us today. First, let's take a little glimpse into the news. According to Archaeologica.org, genetic study offers evidence of recent evolution in Europe. Science has reported on a new genetic study from the team that recently found at least three ancient populations of hunter-gatherers and farmers in the ancestry of modern Europeans. In work presented at the recent annual meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, the team led by population genetist, geneticist Lane Mathieson of the Harvard University Lab of David Reich explained how five genes associated with changes in diet and skin pigmentation underwent strong natural selections and spread rapidly throughout Europe in the past 8,000 years. The first farmers, in addition to the hunter-gatherers, could not digest milk sugars 8,000 years ago. Lactose tolerance became common among Europeans only about 4,300 years ago. The team also tracked three separate genes that produce light skin. The new data confirmed that about 8,500 years ago, hunter-gatherers in Spain, Luxembourg, and Hungary had darker skin, but people from Motela, archaeological site in southern Sweden had both light skin gene variants some 7,700 years ago, and a third gene that causes blue eyes and may contribute to light skin and blonde hair. The first farmers from the Near East also carried both genes for light skin, which they shared with the hunter-gatherers of so Central and Southern Europe. Genes for tallness were favored in Northern and Central Europe, beginning 8,000 years ago, while selection favored shorter people in Italy and Spain. That is some fascinating research. Well, we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we're going to have Greg Little with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back with Greg Little. Dr. Greg Little is a psychologist turned explorer and documentary maker. Since 2003, Greg and his wife, Laura, have been actively searching the Bahamas for archaeological ruins that might be linked to Atlantis, working with the Edgar Cayce Organization in its Search for Atlantis project. Along with archaeologist Bill Donato, the Littles have conducted wide explorations around Bimini, Andros, and the Great Bahama Bank. Their explorations have been featured on the National Geographic Channel, The Learning Channel, MSNBC, Sci-Fi, Discovery, and The History Channel. Greg is co-author of the books Edgar Cayce's Atlantis, Mound Builders, Ancient South America, and The People of the Web, and has over 30 other books in print in various areas of psychology. Hello, Greg, and welcome to Info to Rail, and thank you so much for being with us today. Well, hi, Sue. It's good to meet you, and it's a pleasure to do it, and uh, we'll see where all this goes. Well, to start off with, I am very interested in the whole Atlantis thing. Um, it's been something that's interested me most of my life. Um, when I was a kid, you know, all the it was all a big hype thing about Atlantis, and I watched all the movies and all that stuff. Can you start off telling us what got you into the study of the search for Atlantis? Mm, my. Well, I can, I can pretty much zero it down to a real date. I do recall in my early years reading books uh, that talked about Atlantis and the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, Charles Berlitz wrote a series of books in the late 60s and early 70s that I read, but I never, ever thought that I would actually go and look for things. I'll get on the water, go into water and look, and that actually happened sort of uh, in a roundabout way. Uh, in the year 
2002, I met uh, a British author who's very well known. His name is Andrew Collins. Uh, in fact, I brought Andrew to the Edgar Casey organization in Virginia Beach to a conference to be a speaker there. And when he was there, um, in his book called Gateway to Atlantis, there was a photo in there that I remember seeing in Charles Berlitz's book. And it was a photo of a lar what was called a large triple ring uh, set of standing stones in the Bahamas in shallow water. Now, that was found in the 60s. 1969 is when that triple ring of standing stones was found. Uh, and when I say found, it was, it was seen from the air and it was photographed. And when Andrew was in Virginia Beach at this conference in 2002, I simply decided this thing can be found. I could not at the time understand why nobody had ever found it. Some people claimed that they had tried. They had flown around the Bahamas, particularly around Andros Island, which is the largest of the Bahamas Islands. And, but I just figured this can be done. And at the time, uh, I had the resources to do this. So we began uh, actually by visiting the pilot who was in the plane when the picture was taken. And this was a cargo plane in 1969. We, we ran down this pilot, found him. He lived in Florida and performed an interview with him. And I asked him why no one had ever found this again. And he said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, who has asked you about it? And he said, nobody, ever. Nobody had ever asked him where this, this particular formation was. And he then pulled out his uh, pilot maps of the area, and he had the exact location marked. Subsequently, my wife and I flew down to this area down southern Andros. This is a very remote place. We've since been there um, probably 20 or 30 times in this area on boats. Uh, the airspace that uh, you have to fly through, even though it's in the Bahamas, is Cuban airspace. And up until not many years ago, U.S. planes could not fly in Cuban airspace. In fact, in the 70s, uh, Cuba shot down some American planes there. In any event, we found this from the air. We got the exact GPS on it, and this was in January of 2003 then. My wife and I got on a boat in um, eastern Andros and went through what are called bites in the island. They're very shallow. They're very narrow. Uh, it was about a two-and-a-half to three-hour trip. We never saw another person. We never saw a plane, and we found this place. No one had gone over there. No one else had ever found it. And lo and behold, it was a it was a 500 foot perfect circle. Uh, from the air, uh, you would see what looked like standing stones sticking out of the water, and they turned out to be sponge. All of these were sponge, huge, big sponges that, in low tide would stick out of the water, and from the air, they looked exactly like standing stones. We had another spot to look at in Andros then, and before we left, the night we were about to leave, and if this little event hadn't have happened, we would not have gone back then for 25 weeks over the next 10 years or so. But what happened was a local dive operator who was no longer active came to our door at the motel we were staying, knocked on it, and came in. And he was convinced that we were searching for treasure, which is what almost everybody's looking for in the Bahamas. After we talked to him, we showed him some photos, we showed him the books that we were following, he then shared with us this place that he had found some years earlier and never told anybody about. And what it was was a three-tiered uh, stack of stones massive stones that formed a harbor in Andros. It had never been reported. And it was finding that the morning that we flew out, the morning we had to fly out of Andros, and these are on small charter planes, by the way, the morning we flew out, I snorkeled out, which was actually pretty stupid, uh, about 500, 600 yards into the ocean and found this thing. And I took some photos 
we took them home. Uh, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and then we started studying them, and it was just phenomenal. And then we had to go look at the Bimini Road. I wanted to compare this formation in Andros with what previously had been found in Bimini in the Bahamas and claimed to be part of Atlantis. Of course, that goes to the Edgar Casey predictions about Bimini. But that is how it all started. It really started out of trying to find this triple ring of standing stones that had become very famous, very mysterious, and very enigmatic in the Bahamas. And, of course, it turned out to be completely natural. I had read an article uh, that in 2010 they said that they actually found Atlantis. Well, if you go back and you read a lot of articles, you will see many, many people have claimed to find it. Now, what happens is when you make that claim, you get a lot of media attention, and sometimes someone will make a documentary about it. But the claims that people have found Atlantis, uh, one uh, recent example just a few months ago, they claimed that off Greece they found this mysterious metal that Plato talked about called orichalum. Uh, and what they actually found were ingots of brass. But Plato talked about brass, and brass was not orichalum, which is a strange metal that he said was kind of unique to Atlantis. But you've got people that have claimed to have found Atlantis in off of uh, the coast of Spain, at Spain, at Portugal, in Morocco. Morocco was probably the one you're talking about. Uh, and actually on land in Morocco is where they claim it is. Uh, you have people claiming that it was Santorini near Greece, that it, uh, Thera is also the name of that island. People claim that it was Malta. There's a large group that believe that it was in France. Some believe that it was in the UK, in the British Isles. Uh, the problem with all of those is that, first of all, Plato and Casey, for that matter, made it very plain that Atlantis was far out into the Atlantic. You had to go through the Straits of Gibraltar, which he called the Pillars of Hercules, and you could hop from island, from island to island, reaching an opposite continent. He did mention the Atlantic Ocean. He said that it was a vast ocean and that Atlantis was an island empire. It sank. Here's the real issue. Atlantis was destroyed roughly in the year 9,600 B.C., or 11,600 years ago, according to Plato. At that time, we were in the height of the last ice age, and all of these other places, England, for example, the British Isles, were under ice sheets then. And so were many of these other places that people claimed to be Atlantis. Uh, so... You hear these reports all the time that we found Atlantis. There's a guy that believes that Atlantis uh, was in Peru, that it was inland in Peru. He's actually he's written a book about it. Uh, he's gotten a lot of attention for it. There's been several documentaries made about it. But as of right now, no one, including us, has ever found anything which can clearly be shown to be a part of Atlantis. Wow. Can you tell it's us... Sad, but that's it true. is sad. I saw a movie, and I thought it was the coolest thing I ever saw. Um, in that movie, they were, um, they had the grandfather had gone missing, and they, you know, the they went to find him, and they had to fly through this really weird uh, storm that they nobody could really fly through, and or has ever made it through, except for the grandfather. And when they did find him, he was on Atlantis, and well. It sunk. <laughs> I am, I'm actually familiar with that movie. And those, the, the movies that are like that, they take two things and they weave them together. Uh, and they're actually based on Edgar Cayce. That's one of the things. And secondly, they weave together elements of the Bermuda Triangle, which I also have an interest in. Uh, Edgar Cayce said that the main islands of Atlantis were in the area today known as the Bermuda Triangle. Of course, he didn't call it that. Uh, he simply said that it was in the, uh, well, he didn't use the term Bahamas either because it wasn't called it, called the Bahamas then. Uh, but it was in the area of the West Indies. Uh, and we, we know that roughly from the 40s onward, there have been many, many reports of strange weather phenomena there. We've experienced a lot of that ourselves. Uh, banks of fog that you really can't see through. Strange things happen to magnetic compasses. 
uh, but the, most of those movies are based on Casey's visions of Atlantis. Uh, there probably there has been a lot of evidence of these civilizations that existed during the last ice age. When I say no one's found anything that is that is definitive of Atlantis or proof of it, that's true because no one's found up found pulled up a a sign that says "Welcome to Atlantis." Or you're entering the center city of Poseidia. Nobody's ever found anything like that. There have been there have been bits and pieces of things found and archaeological remnants that go back close to that date. And there are many, um, in, even in the Bahamas, that pr- probably go back to at least 6,000 years ago. Uh, but doing underwater research is very very difficult. Uh, things get covered with coral. They get covered with sediment. And the worst thing is they get covered with uh, Limestone forming, Um, there's a cementation process that occurs, uh, and the bottom actually gets hard and rises, uh, and that's what's going on in the Bahamas, and then everything is coated with, oh, in some cases, several feet of coral, and of course, it's illegal to dig through coral. Uh, But there there have been some things found around the world that go back to that time frame of Atlantis, uh, including uh, at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and it goes back exactly to 9600 B.C., and this site in Turkey was covered suddenly in 9600 B.C. by the people that were there. I know you have a guest coming called Andrew Collins. I've already talked about him, and Andrew is the expert on Gobekli Tepe. Oh, that's going to be interesting. Um, Why is it against the law to dig through coral? Uh, well, coral is living. It's living rock, and coral supports a lot of uh, marine life. Uh, it, it supports microorganisms uh, who feed off of it, and then there are larger organisms that feed off these uh, microorganisms, and then small fish feed off them, and then it just gets bigger and bigger, uh, and ultimately uh, they become coral reefs, and they're just densely packed with life. Uh, and coral reefs are dying around the world right now. It's called bleaching, uh, and it is a real problem. And in the Bahamas in particular, you cannot, you're not even supposed to touch coral. Uh, even coral, like we've gone, we have dove to roughly 120 feet, which is far too deep for what's called recreational divers. But we have gone down to that depth, uh, doing, making documentaries with the National Geographic and History Channel, and the coral is so thick down there, uh, even at 120 feet, that you cannot tell what the rock is under it. Uh, and there's actually structures there. There are these stone formations that are very regular, very patterned, and they're rectangular. But they're covered with six to, to eight inches up to a foot and a half of coral. So it's impossible to be able to tell what in the world is under this. Uh, these rectangular formations. There's actually a series of about 150 of these formations uh, in deep water right off of Bimini, which would have been the the coastline in 10,000 B.C. Do you think that that will um, cause a problem to never be able to find Atlantis since you can't dig through that? Well, yes, it is a problem. Um uh, Absolutely. If Atlantis existed, which I think it probably did, something existed then, but if Atlantis existed, it's not going to be found in the middle of a continent or in the middle of land. It is underwater. It is underwater along a coastline somewhere, uh, but the water is is fairly deep now. Uh, It's at least 100 feet to 150 feet, which again puts it at the 10,000 B.C. coastline. And it's just really difficult to work there. There is nothing that we have now that can penetrate the coral uh, sort of electronically to the extent to where we can tell exactly what's under it. And it's very in the Bahamas now, you cannot get a permit to do anything. You can't get permits to do geological work <clears throat> or archaeological work. They've had a moratorium for about three years now. Uh, and <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to drill through coral uh, you're limited anyway as to what you can find. If you drill through coral, you've got a small core hole, and then you're pulling out stone. But all you can tell then is the age of the coral and how long the stone has been there and what the stone is. 
but you can't tell what the stone is forming, if it's in a lot of blocks, uh, and is it a building under this floor? That's what you can't tell. And I doubt that within our lifetimes that we will ever be able to go there and get down and see what these things really are. We have tried. We've filmed them extensively. Uh, we've spent, oh, I would say, a couple hundred hours uh, filming these underwater formations off of the coast of Bimini. And we have lots of side scan rad radar. We have our own radar, which shows how uniform these things are and how they lined up on this coastline, much like cargo buildings would be along the coastline. Uh, but we cannot do anything else with it. And, and yes, that's a problem. Uh, but it's a problem that you just simply have to accept that we'll probably never be able to go down there and do anything that's definitive. Um, to your knowledge, how many ice ages have we had? Uh, I know there have been several. Uh, I cannot tell you offhand how many. Uh, the last one, I think, lasted 250 years, 250,000 years, sorry. There was a mini ice age that occurred back um, Oh, my, uh, not all that long ago. It didn't last long. And then before that, there have been many. Uh, I know off the coast of Florida, uh, the, the underwater archaeologists have found multiple Ice Age shorelines. Uh, I want to say there's at least seven or eight just off in, in the continental shelf off of Florida. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know that exact number of how many that geologically that they know for sure that we've had. But it could well be dozens. Huh. That's interesting to me. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your research and what you found up to date? Sure. Um, we started this again, and in, in, it was in late 2002 when we decided to start it. And in 2003, we started making trips to the Bahamas. Initially, uh, we had to really dig around. Uh, I guess that's a bad word. Uh, we had to search for people who were willing to take us out to these remote places. And luckily, we were naive. And what I mean by that is uh, we didn't really realize how dangerous it was to go to some of these spots. Uh, Andros is the largest of the Bahama Islands, but it's also uh, the most unexplored ever. There are no people whatsoever in this western part, there is you can actually get in the water off the coastline of southern Andros, and at, at low tide, you can walk 10 miles into the ocean, and the water is not over your head. So it's so shallow that boats have real trouble getting in there. You have to go in in very small boats, but it's so remote. There's nothing out there. There are no there's no habitation places. There are no fishermen. None of, none of the fishermen go there. Uh, it's about 150 miles from the coast of Florida, so that is quite a ways, but it's another country. You can't just go from Florida there. You have to go through customs. Uh, it's about 100 miles from Cuba, uh, but it's very, very difficult to get around to Andros and, say, go up uh, two-thirds of the way of the coast, which is about a 200-mile run then to try and even get fuel. So you have to carry enough fuel, you have to carry enough food, you have to have several engines, but you have to have a really shallow draft. Your boat can't can't be more than a foot in the water, or you wind up you're going to wind wind up running aground. So we started by chartering small locals who were willing to do this for large sums of money. You have to really overpay to get people to do this. Initially, also, we chartered uh, a low-wing, I'm sorry, a high-wing plane. It's called a Norman Islander, and I had to convince uh, a charter service to fly my wife and I down into Cuban airspace. We stayed at 500 feet below Cuban radar, um, but I had to convince them to do this. And we made numerous trips up and down the Andros coast. Uh, one of them was six hours, uh, trying to find formations, uh, and then we made several other flights, long flights, where we looked around in deeper water, and we wound up coming up with about 150 spots 
off the coast of Andros with uh, the GPS coordinates, or the, the close to the GPS coordinates, which we took from the air. And eventually, we, we then found some people in Bimini who we could go to. Uh, we zeroed in on a husband and wife couple who are no longer now a husband and wife, uh, and we, we used them and their boat for many years. And, but eventually, we had to get our own boat. Uh, so we got our own boat that was uh, comfortable enough and carried enough fuel to be able to do these things. And we would charter a large mothership, which we would uh, tie our boat to the back and tow it down. We'd carry a lot of fuel so we could refuel the smaller boat every day. And then the large boat would uh, essentially anchor in deep water. And then we would take our smaller boat, which was very fast. It can go 50 miles an hour, actually 55 miles an hour, but you seldom go that fast in the ocean. Uh, but we went up and down to virtually all of these 150 spots. Out of the 150 spots, we wound up finding uh, that roughly 30 of these were crashed airplanes. We found that maybe seven or eight relatively modern boats in those spots. We found three or four ancient boats. Uh, all of these were reported to the Bahamas government officially. A couple of those are, were definitely Spanish galleons. Uh, they probably did not have any gold in them at all, but we verified that they were Spanish galleons in a, in a pretty unique way. Most people don't know this. Uh, but those ships were, were made and built uh, usually in Cuba. And the Spanish, would, of course, looted the gold from the Maya, uh, the Incas, and then they took whatever the gold was to Cuba where they melted it down into ingots, gold and silver. But when they built the boats over there, they had to put nails in them, and they used a type of brass nail. And when they made the brass, they had to melt it all down, but they used the same basic pots that they melted the gold and silver in. So if you pull out, say, a nail from one of these boats, and the only wood that is ever left, it has to be totally covered by sand. If you uncover the wood from those boats, uh, you find many, many nails in them. And so you have to test the nails, uh, do a scanning electron microscope on them, and there's some other tests. And we found that they all had traces of gold and silver in them. Uh, and that's the confirmation that it's a galleon. Uh, but we found three or four of those. We also found several very unusual piles of stone that appeared to have been buildings in shallow water. Uh, in those 150 spots, and others were natural coral heads that are a little bump in the ocean where coral starts and then slowly but surely, uh, because of all the life that, that comes into these coral heads, they start creating a circular pattern around it. So out of the 150 spots, 30-some 30, 30 of them were airplanes. Uh, a couple of those were Bermuda Triangle disappearance planes. Uh, and a number of them were ships and boats, uh, and some were these odd stone formations, and the rest were natural. On land, we found that uh, we, we went into a lot of caves in the, in, uh, at Andros. Uh, we explored, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry? Excuse me, I just had to cough, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, but we explored a lot over uh, roughly a, from 2003 uh, until about a year and a half ago, we spent approximately 25 weeks in the Bahamas, most of which were on water. We spent almost all of our time on water. We did take our boat, and we would sometimes stay on land where we would explore. Uh, we got in the later years uh, used to using uh, Google Earth, which we could zero in. Uh, we did find some weird things with Google Earth that are just unexplained, square formations, uh, the hidden formations in, in southern Andros and a couple other islands. Uh, north of Andros, in a place called Jewelters, it's also totally uninhabited, and you need shallow boats to get in there. Uh, we found a, a stone wall, which we were actually told about by locals, uh, old-time fishermen, 
that were in their 80s and 90s told us about this stone wall, and the way they put it is it's always it's always been there. Uh, but we did find the remnants of that at Jewelters, and that was very strange. Uh, there was a large stone platform uh, which was square, a large square platform, and then off of it there were all these stone blocks arranged into a wall, but it's all underwater now. Uh, but the water isn't that deep around it. It's maybe six or seven feet over the top of it. Uh, so that was very easy for us to see. Just lots of strange things like that. Lots of strange weather phenomena. Uh, we had a couple of uh, odd occurrences with the compass. Uh, we had many, many electrical issues, especially with the mothership. Um, and just a, a lot of strange things. Uh, nothing that I would say is is totally out of the ordinary, but there were some really unusual things that happened over those years. Can you tell us about the constellation of Cygnus? Yeah, uh, Cygnus is uh, it's known as the Northern Cross. It does fit into a lot of this. Uh, Andrew Collins is the uh, the key person who started really the the whole Cygnus movement. Uh, Andrew's book called The Cygnus Mystery, I think it was 2004 it came out. Uh, Andrew found that the three main pyramids at Giza aligned to the constellation of Cygnus. Now Cygnus is, has three main stars in a bar, and then it has a series of four stars and it forms a perfect cross. Uh, in the month of October in the northern hemisphere, it is basically directly overhead uh, at 10 a.m. And it was seen in ancient times as a bird, mainly a swan or a rat bird of some kind. Native Americans uh, believed uh, that it was a raptor bird, and it fits into ancient beliefs that Native Americans had about death and the death journey. Uh, particularly the mound builders saw it as part of the death journey, and it's actually the key spot in the whole death journey. Uh, but you probably know from, for decades, uh, alternative believers, alternative historians, of which I am, um, have asserted that the three main pyramids at Giza in Egypt were aligned to the constellation of Orion. Now, the problem with that Orion theory, among other, there's one big problem, and that is, is that Orion really doesn't fit the three pyramids. Uh, you actually have to take the star chart and turn it upside down, and if you actually lay the stars on top of the three pyramids, one of them doesn't touch. Uh, so the, what was done back to make it fit is that they used, uh, and this was actually uh, the people that were involved in the Orion constellation theory in the beginning of it. Uh, you have to blow those stars up and make them very, very large, and then they appear to fit over the three pyramids there. Now, it is true that Orion mattered in Egypt. Uh, one of the shafts in the king's chamber points direct, I'm sorry, the queen's chamber actually points directly uh, to Orion. And it was believed that it was a journey that the pharaoh took. Uh, and this, all this fits Cygnus, and it's going to in a few minutes. But the problem has always been that Orion really doesn't fit the three pyramids. And they initially said that all the other stars of the constellation of Orion, uh, other pyramids were at, at virtually all the points where those stars would have fallen on the ground. And that's not true. Now, in 2004, Andrew Collins, through happenstance, uh, it was actually a British engineer, uh, told him, uh, showed him his work, and his work was that, my God, the three belt stars or the central stars of the constellation of Cygnus fit the three pyramids perfectly. And when they laid the other stars of Cygnus, they all laid right on top of the Giza Plateau and were all at significant spots too, except for one. Um, then uh, after that was found, it's really rather happenstance, uh, this same British engineer went to Andrew Collins and had calculated that there was a place near where this one star of Cygnus, which is called Deneb, 
uh, there didn't seem to be anything there. But they found Andrew then went to England with, I'm sorry, to uh, Egypt with the support of the Edgar Casey Foundation. And he, his wife, and his uh, a colleague found inside a tomb entrance there a cave system that they followed for 350 feet under the Giza Plateau toward the Great Pyramid. At the end of this cave system, they came to a tube, which they crawled in a brief, for a brief uh, length, but they turned back. Uh, and the reason they turned back is they simply weren't equipped for it. Now, they went to Zahi Hawass, who was then the head of, of all Egyptian antiquities. He was the head of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. And they, they met with Zahi and told Zahi about this. They gave him pictures and a map. And Zahi then said, we already know everything about this. There's nothing there. It's just a tomb. And Andrew, Andrew told Zahi, no, it's a cave system in the tube. And Zahi immediately issued a press release and put on his website that there is no such thing as a cave there, that it's all a tomb, and that everyone, they already knew about the tomb. It was less than six months later when the show uh, called Chasing Mummies, uh, the History Channel did this show with Zahi, which lasted one season, and they entered into this tomb. Now, there are... There's background information about this that I know that it's not on the show, uh, but the archaeologists involved with it have supplied us with all this information. Uh, when Zahi went into the tomb to film this, he said he was going to show that it was just a tomb, and there was no cave there. And so he started walking around the tomb, and it was actually the archaeologists from America who had contacted Andrew Collins and actually Andrew, read Andrew's book about this, and they had to turn around and say, Dr. Hawass, it's not there. It's down here. And so they took him to a place, and it's a crack in a wall that you go through. And through this crack, and you suddenly get into this massive cavern, and then it has leading off of it several different cave tunnels. And Zahi did not know it was there, and it's not on any Egypt, modern Egyptian surveys of the Giza Plateau. But Hawass didn't even know it was there. Now, he went through it. It was filled with bats. Uh, it has, um, there are fumes in it. You have to wear some breathing equipment. Uh, of course, it's dark, so they had to bring in lights. Uh, on, that, on that episode of Chasing Mummies, Zahi uh, pretty much screamed constantly. He does not like bats. They went the same 350 feet that Andrew did, came to the same tube, uh, the same tube at the end of this 350 feet. Uh, one of the archaeologists then climbed 30 feet up into this tube, and the tube split off two ways. Uh, on the show, Zahi says, well, it ends there. It doesn't go any further, and he calls everybody that believes that there's anything under Giza a pyramidia, which is actually an interesting term. But the archaeologists have reported that, no, it went on. It's just this person did not know if he was going to find anywhere where he could turn around and go back. And it took him quite a while to go backwards because this, this tube is only about a foot and a half in diameter. But it's unknown as to how, how far it goes. Uh, Andrew believes it probably does go all of the way to the under the Great Pyramid, which is the Central Pyramid. Uh, and there is uh, a ground-penetrating radar study that was actually done by Europe from space that shows that there is some sort of a tunnel system uh, that does go all the way under the Great Pyramid. So this whole tunnel system was found because of Andrew's uh, Cygnus work, believing that the Cygnus constellation is what the um, three main stars of the Giza pyramids are mimicking on Earth. Now, the oddest thing about all of this, this past year, Andrew visited, and we uh, essentially worked on a book together. And the book is about Native American death beliefs, particularly ancient mound builders' beliefs, uh, and the issue of giant skeletons found in America, which is kind of interesting in itself. Uh, and what has been found, and this is not my work, I'm actually going to quote modern American mainstream archaeologists in this. 
the mound building civilizations, which essentially disappeared around the year 1200 or 1300 AD, they believed that when the soul died, it did in fact make a leap to Orion. Uh, and it actually went to a fuzzy nebula, which is just below the three belt stars of Orion. Uh, it's the same thing the ancient Maya believed. The Maya called this fuzzy star, which is a nebula, uh, Shilbaba. But at, that was only the beginning of the soul's journey. So the soul made this leap to this. It's called M42. So it uh, is a nebula. It's the Orion Nebula. And from there, then the soul transitioned to the Milky Way. Uh, it, it, when, when you see Orion on the western horizon, you usually see it early in the morning, right before sunrise. So the, the soul would make the leap to Orion. It would then go under and around the Earth as safely through the underworld, in essence. The next night... The Milky Way would come up in a horizontal band, and the soul would go from this M42 constellation, or Shilbaba, to what is called the Path of Souls, which is the Milky Way, and then make a trip. All the stars, according to this Native American belief, are souls making a trip. And this trip takes them along the edges of the Milky Way, and then they eventually get to the Cygnus constellation. And there they meet a bird, a raptor bird, which makes a judgment on the soul. And if they pass this judgment, then the soul is allowed to go through an opening that leads it out of what is called the sky dome. And it goes back to where all souls originate. So all of this stuff kind of fits together. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, but that's how Cygnus fits into this. Hmm. Huh. Probably more than you wanted. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Uh, I love the constellations, and I'm very into, you know, the astrology part of things. Um, to be an archaeologist, is what does that take to um, your permissions and such to be able to be an archaeologist? Well, to be an archaeologist in the United States, uh, if you get a bachelor's degree in archaeology, you can go to work... Uh, with various archaeological firms, and you'll basically do some digs. Uh, you'll be involved in actual excavations, uh, but you, you're not a licensed archaeologist. Then. If you want to be an archaeologist in the United States who is licensed to do work, you have to get at least a master's degree. Then you go through a little procedure, uh, and you get a certification, uh, which allows you then to be able to do certain excavations uh, in general, you need a master's degree to teach in college. Uh, there are many, many more archaeologists than there are jobs. That's one of those fields that if you look up what are the job prospects in archaeology, you will find there aren't very many. And there are far more PhDs in archaeology than there are academic jobs. Uh, so it's, it's one of those fields that loads of people love to go into, but after they're in it for a while, uh, they realize it's hard to make a living in it. Now, I am not an archaeologist. We do get permits in other countries. We do not get them in the United States because we don't do much of anything here. I visit Indian mounds and archaeological sites, uh, but I won't touch anything or dig and or pick up relics, anything like that. I have no interest in that. Uh, but we do get them in other countries, and that, that is a, a different procedure. But here in the States, you basically need to get a master's degree uh, and it's not that difficult to get. It's just once you get it, your job prospects are very limited. Uh, archae and most of the people who have the master's degrees or the doctorates, they don't actually do any of the excavations. They oversee them. Uh, they would be the ones who would do interpretation of whatever is found. But most of the work is done by students or by people that have a bachelor's degree, uh, and they're generally very low paid. Uh, but it's something a lot of people like to do, at least in their younger years. So that's what it takes in the U.S. In other countries, it's a big diff. It's a it's it's somewhat different, and it depends on what country. Uh, in the Bahamas, you go through a permit process. Uh, what we usually do is we take an archaeologist with us. We have employed uh, an archaeologist uh, 
we usually get filming permits. That's another thing you can do because we don't dig in the Bahamas. We don't do anything that is called excavation. Uh, we, we, by getting a film permit, are allowed to go down and make documentaries at various sites. Uh, but we don't actually excavate. I don't excavate. I don't collect artifacts or anything like that. I think that would be fascinating. That's something I've always wanted to do. I think that it's it, fascinating to, you know, you get, I try to find these movies, because I'm a movie person, I love movies, but I try to find them where, and there's there's so few archaeological movies these days, but I so love the adventure, you know, when they get in there and it's it's finding new stuff and, and you know, the more in depth they get into these caves and stuff, the things that they find. Oh yeah. Well, you know, you don't need you don't need to be to be able to explore and go to places. You don't usually need a permit. Uh, you either you go on public land. Uh, there are so many sites that can be seen. And I, I I wrote a series of articles that have been in literally thousands of newspapers around the country about visiting American Indian mounds. Most people don't know this, but the most extensive ancient earthworks and the most incredible ancient earthworks are here in America. The, mo the, the most extensive earthwork, geometric earthworks anywhere on Earth are in Newark, Ohio, of all places. And Newark is about uh, 35 to 40 miles to the east of Columbus, Ohio. But there is just incredible stuff there. And it's the kind of stuff, that, I'll give you an example. We took Andrew Collins to the, the British author to the Newark Earthworks, uh, I believe it was in 2004 is the first time we took him. And Andrew actually at the time lived in the world's largest stone circle, which is called Avebury, which is not too far from Stonehenge. So Andrew goes to Stonehenge all the time. He li actually had one of the standing stones at Avebury in his backyard. Now, Avebury wow. is a 30-acre hinge. They call them hinges there. But it's like a 30-acre earthwork that has a massive outer wall, and then there's a moat inside of it. And then it had three rings of standing stones, giant standing stones. So when we took Andrew to Newark and we stood at the first spot, which is a large earthwork, that encloses 20 acres, and it is connected to an octagon that is an earthwork. For, now, when I say an earthwork, I mean it's – I don't I don't know where you live, but most of your people are familiar with a levee, a levee along a river, which is a long, linear embankment of earth that holds the water in. So imagine the ancient people building what um, what amounts to being a levee. And they make these levees into perfect circles that enclose 20, 30, 40 acres. And one of these circles in Newark that has this outer earthwork formed like a levee, about 15 feet in height, uh, connects to an octagon made of eight, si eight perfectly straight sides inside of each of the eight sides of the octagon. Now, it's a 50-acre octagon. That is very, very large. There is a truncated pyramid, an earthen truncated pyramid, a perfect pyramid with a flat top. That's what a truncated pyramid is. Uh, inside of each of the eight points of this octagon. And then there was a set of linear lines, long linear lines, miles long, that connected to a perfect 30-acre circle identical to what is at what is at Avebury in England, and then these connect to all kinds of squares and circles immediately in the Newark area, but there is a 56, and this is getting complicated, there's a 56-mile long road that is outlined by two parallel running walls of earth, perfectly straight, 56 miles, to an identical circle and octagon formation in Chillicothe, Ohio. And then in Chillicothe, there are dozens of other sites that have, that are, that have the similar earthworks. This is all in one little area in Ohio. 
there were a million or so of these kinds of things in ancient America. Today, there's a couple thousand of them that survive. There's probably 100,000 Indian mounds that survive today. Many of those are truncated pyramids. But a lot of these you can visit. There are many, many of these that you can visit. They are national parks. They are state parks. They are county parks. Um, and they're, they're easy to see. And I wrote articles about these. I've written – like I said, they've been in thousands of newspapers. And one of the things I did in 2007 was publish an encyclopedia about this. It's called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Native American Mounds and Earthworks. Uh, and it was a long-running task that I actually started in 1983 uh, and finished in 2006. But there are lots of things that you can see in America now. Uh, that will rival anything you see in the ancient world. In fact, one of the Indian mounds that exists in America at Cahokia, Illinois, which is across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, it's about five miles from St. Louis, uh, the, the mound there is called Monk's Mound. It is, a ten, it is as tall as a 10-story building. It's 100 feet tall, so it has a flat top, but it's a perfect pyramid with a flat top. Its base is larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza. Wow. And inside of it, we know at its base, is a massive three-tiered stone chamber that has never been dug into and probably will not within our lifetime because of uh, the passage of recent laws and so on. But you can, you can pretty much do archaeology. You can visit sites. You can see lots of things in America now and you don't have to be an archaeologist to really get into this. Uh, I mean, I've written loads of books in this field, and I'm actually fairly well known in it, uh, but I'm not an archaeologist. Actually, I'm a psychologist by profession. I think that's fascinating. That's something I've always wanted to do, you know, later in my life when I'm a little bit older. And, you know, I'd like to travel, and I would love to be able to check these places out and just to say that I could actually walk there, you know. Oh, yes. Well, can you tell me the basic area of the country you live in? I'm just curious. Um, I live in New York, and uh, okay. I'm down right uh, on one of the Finger Lakes. I live in Canadagua. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, there are, there are uh, mounds in uh, – New York State used to have quite a few, and almost all of those were destroyed by the early settlers. Uh, in fact, they they liked using the earth from the mounds in the earthworks uh, because they could flatten it and it was pretty fertile and they could take that earth and spread it on their farms and use it. Uh, but there are uh, mounds remaining in Canada. There are quite a few mounds um, in extreme western, let's see, west, uh, southwestern New York. There are quite a few, and of course there are some in Pennsylvania. Uh, but the area where you are, unfortunately, does not have as many large mounds as there are in the in the central part of the country. But it's not that far. Uh, it would not be that far to just take a little cruise down to Columbus, Ohio sometime. Uh, you'd be looking probably at a one-day drive. That, that would be about it. Uh, Columbus is right uh, – it's kind of in the middle of the state of Ohio, but you don't even need to go to Columbus. You just go to Newark. Uh, it's pretty much straight shot. Take a two-day trip. Take a weekend trip sometime. Take your kids along. That's one of the things that I have really pressed over the years. These sites need Americans to recognize them, and they need visitors. Uh, American archaeology is really in dire straits. There's just not a lot of money for things to be uh, – for work to go on in America anymore. About the only excavation is going on is called public archaeology and conservation archaeology. And what that is is that when we build a new road or they are putting a new bridge in uh, or they're clearing land for uh, a shopping center or something, uh, they have to do a survey of the site first to make sure that there are no archaeological remains there. And that's what conservation archaeology is. And that is most of the archaeology going on today. And they usually begin just with basic surface collections. A couple people go out and walk it, and they look to see if there are any artifacts on the surface. I think, But going to mounds is a great thing to do. It's a great way to really get into archaeology. And here in America, 
we have as great a mysteries as there are anywhere else. In fact, uh, the first pyramids, the, the first mounds in Egypt date to 3000 BC. The first mounds in America, the United States, uh, the very first mounds date to 3700 BC. Wow. The, the stuff going on here is older than it was in Egypt. In fact, the oldest mounds in the world are in South America. And they go back to at least 10,000 years ago in South America. And that's just, that's something very few people are aware of. Uh, but it, it's true that we have tremendous mysteries here, but for whatever reason, most Americans are fascinated with Egyptian archeology span or Turkey or England. Uh, or other areas, and I'm not I'm not sure why it could go back to early uh, biases toward Native Americans, uh, but I don't know. I just think the idea most people think Indian mounds are simply tiny little burial heaps of earth, uh, but they're not. Some of them were, of course, but a lot of them were gigantic pyramids inside of them are stone structures. Many of them had stone structures and stone tombs where the, the stonework in, in these is phenomenal. Uh, and there are some really good old pictures from the 1800s when the Smithsonian was digging into them. Uh, there's some great photos of those. I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of us are unaware of all that, you know, that is in our our region, you know. I was unaware that there was that many mounds that close to home. Well, most people are unaware of it. it it's so bad uh, that when we first took Andrew to this site in Newark, and he stood there, and his, I mean, he lives in Avery, but his jaw just dropped, and he said, my God, I had no idea. You cannot read descriptions of these places in America and get a good feel for it. You just, if you see it, you just, it, it's, just, it's truly awesome. Uh, but he said, you could put 50 stone hinges in here just when he looked at one small circle. And he said, I have no idea why anyone would build something this massive. The scale of these is enormous. But here's the weird thing. Keep in mind, these were Native Americans. These were Indians that built this. Uh, this circle and octagon, it is known now exactly what it was used for. It was a predictor of eclipses. It perfectly predicted when lunar and solar eclipses were going to happen. And the lunar cycle, to predict lunar eclipses, you need to follow the moon for over 30 years to go through one cycle. It's 30.16 years. Somebody, when they built the circle and octagon in Newark, Ohio, somebody carefully charted the movements of the moon, where it rose and where it sat, where, where it would sit, set each and every night for 30 years. And during this 30-year time, they made a mark of where it set the furthest south the fur and rose the furthest south, where it set the furthest north and rose the furthest north, where it had a lunar standstill. And then they were able, that's just one cycle, they would have to watch it again to make sure they had it correct. But somebody did this. And it is a calculator. It is a, it is a perfect calculator to calculate the eclipses of the moon. Now, I'm the, I didn't find that out. That was actually found out by a couple of university professors that went there and actually used a computer system to figure it out. And now that's accepted in mainstream archaeology. Uh, and the one that attaches to this one in Newark that is 56 miles away uh, in Chillicothe, Ohio, well, it does the exact same thing. It is a lunar calculator that is used to predict the eclipses of the moon. And that's very, very bizarre. And this site goes back to 500 B.C. It's 2,500 years old. 
Wow. And it's astonishing what they were able to do. That is, that is fascinating. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book, From the Ashes of Angels? Well, that, that is actually Andrew's book. Uh, Andrew, that's Andrew's. I know you're going to talk to Andrew in a couple weeks. Uh, I know I sent you some, some information. Uh, the Cygnus Mystery is, is one of Andrew's books. It's one of his classics. And Ashes of Angels is actually the book that I read of his that led me to him. And it's about the Nephilim and the Watchers. Uh, my books are the, uh, well, I have, actually, I have six, over 60 books in print. Uh, but my books that are of in, interest here, uh, the first one was called The Archetype Experience, and it was in 1984. Uh, and then there were, there were two others that I followed up with, People of the Web and Grand Illusions. They're very difficult to find now. Uh, and both of those, all three of those books were about a combination of things. They were about UFOs, uh, beliefs of, about extraterrestrials. They were about uh, Edgar Cayce. Uh, and they were also about uh, spiritual ideas and apparitional phenomena. Uh, and then over the years, I've followed it up with several books on Atlantis published by the ARE Press, which is the Cayce organization. Uh, my wife and I have, have uh, co-authored a series of books through the Casey organization. Uh, they're on ancient mysteries. Uh, there's a, a variety of those. Uh, I'm almost losing count here. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently, I had this one called The Path of Souls come out, which is about the Native American death ideas. Uh, we've done a book on uh, South American archaeology called Ancient South America. Uh, an earlier one called Mound Builders, which was in the year 2000, uh, that illustrated that uh, out of all of them, the one that I'm clearly the most proud of because it's the one that wore me out is called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Native American Mounds and Earthworks. Um, but uh, that's just kind of a um, that's kind of a hodgepodge of them. And then I've made a lot of films uh, and been on a lot of documentaries, of course. And you can. People can find those just by going to YouTube uh, and plug in Greg Little or plug in, say, Bermuda Triangle Greg Little, and it'll pop up, or Atlantis in my name, and they'll pop up. What is your belief in the UFOlogy? Well, uh, they do it. There is such a thing uh, as a UFO, unidentified flying object. They they are in the air. Personally. Uh, I have done a lot of research on it. Uh, I wrote an introduction to a book Andrew Collins did a few years ago. The book was called Light Quest. Uh, and the introduction that I wrote was about university-sponsored research that, that ufologists ignore. Uh, that is, the people that are in the field, they tend to ignore this research. Um, and in the, in the 80s, there was... There was a university uh, called SEMO, Southeastern Missouri State University. The physics department chairman, uh, along with uh, roughly 30-some other scientists there and elsewhere, including a number of us astronomers, uh, they set about trying to figure out what was causing a massive UFO flap in Missouri at the time. It's a very famous flap, and there have been geez, thousands of articles written about it. Their study lasted for seven years. Uh, Harley Rutledge was the, uh, the PhD who was the head of the physics department at the time, and he generated a book about it. Uh, and what Rutledge found was that the UFOs that were being seen and interacted with there, they got a number of photos of them, um, were intelligent plasma formations intelligent plasmas that interacted with the observers. And I have, since the 80s, since the early 80s, come to the exact same conclusion that there is a, uh, an energy, an, an intelligent form of energy that is somewhat related to Earth-generated uh, energy. Uh, it is a it's as natural as human beings are natural, uh, but it has its own intelligence and it interacts with us. Carl Jung talked about it. Uh, a number of old-time ufologists talked about it in their own way. Uh, 
John Keel was one. The Mothman Prophecies movie is, is probably about this same phenomenon. But my belief is they are an intelligent energy that can manifest in physical reality um, for a period of time, not uh, indefinitely. Uh, the process that they use in, in occult, in old occult lore was called transmutation. Um, from, the, from the position of physics, what they are is they are in the invisible end of the electromagnetic energy spectrum. And by altering their frequency um, in, in light, they can become physically real for a temporary period of time. But they do interact with humans, and they have a purpose uh, that is difficult for humans to understand. Uh, and that's probably the best way that I can put it. They're an intelligent energy form, and for lack of a better term right now, uh, they're plasmoid in their nature. And recently, even the British Ministry of Defense uh, came up with the exact same conclusion, even referencing... Um, some of the stuff that Andrew Collins and I did back in the 80s independently, not even knowing each other then. But that's kind of my take on it. Uh, these things can manifest in various ways, physically and as uh, beings. And without going into a lot of detail and all that and the background and research that's gone on with it, uh, that's just kind of a summary then. Um, I've been a... Uh paranormal researcher for a number of years and very into spiritualist stuff and uh i'm a tarot reader as well and i just this stuff just fascinates me uh, i absolutely believe in ufos i absolutely believe in aliens um i've never actually came in contact or had any you know thing happen to me that way but I often wonder why I don't because I believe in them. Uh, it just, it makes me wonder if they're have a, you know, what their agenda is. If it's an Well, that's, you know, uh, first, uh, let me go back and just correct one thing here. I absolutely believe there is uh, alien life out there. And I actually believe that there have been visitations. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think that the thousands of UFO reports that come in all the time are alien visits. I think that's a lot of other stuff. I do believe that from time to time, aliens have been here. And actually, you're familiar with the astronomer Carl Sagan, at least with his name, right? Yes. Okay, Carl Sagan was a skeptic. Carl Sagan was probably the most famous astronomer, actually, I think, in the United States ever. Uh, in 1963, Carl Sagan published a long paper in a journal called Planetary and Space Science. And in that journal, Sagan did calculations and said, essentially, it is not only statistically probable that aliens have visited the Earth countless times in the past, it is a statistical certainty that aliens have been here countless times in the past. The only question is, is what kind of trace did they leave behind? He even suggested maybe archaeologists need to go to ancient Sumeria intentionally to look for evidence of aliens being here. But, I mean, even the greatest skeptic, astronomical skeptic of all time said that aliens have definitely visited. So I believe that, that yes, they have been here. Uh, they may even from time to time come in and out of here even now, but there are tens of thousands of UFO reports every year, and that's really what I'm responding to. There is something that generates all those reports. It's very clear that humans can interact with some sort of energy which alters our perceptions, uh, but what that energy is, I don't think one can even talk about an agenda. The example that John Keel used, which was shown in the movie, um, the Mothman prophecies. In his book on that, John Keel said that it, trying to, for them to explain to us what their purpose or agenda is, it's akin to us trying to explain to an ant, A-N-T, an ant on the ground, 
what we're doing. Uh, it's kind of useless. Uh, the ant cannot possibly comprehend the movements of a human being and what we do. Um, and that's what Keel thinks the situation well, thought. He's dead now, of course. But that's what he thinks uh, the alien agenda is, too, that it's so far beyond anything we could comprehend that they they don't tell us. They just do whatever it is they do. Hmm. That does make sense. Well, it makes sense. I don't know that it's true. It's just one explanation. Um, but I don't really know. I think if we were traveling uh, around the universe, we would be very much like uh, the Star Trek people, and that is observe and monitor, but don't deliberately go in and uh, alter things. Although on virtually every Star Trek episode, they go in and alter things. Right. Um, I'm sorry? You're right. I, I agree with that. Yeah. But I think they have traveled around and observed things and monitored. And for whatever reason, uh, in the 1950s, the common idea was was that we had developed nuclear weapons suddenly and used them in, in the 40s uh, in Japan. And then there was so, so much nuclear testing done on through the rest of the 40s and early 50s that it brought – aliens here to check up on us because we had suddenly become dangerous to the to other places that we had developed weapons that truly were dangerous even to them uh that was the thinking then was it true i don't know it's it, it does that makes sense too that they would increase the amount of monitoring that they did on earth once we developed nuclear weapons and had the capability of delivering those uh, and all that happened in the 50s. And the for late 40s and early 50s was when there was a huge increase of UFO activity and UFO reports. Very true. So do you have anything, um, any more digs and stuff um, or any more uh, research that is coming up for you in the near future? Well, actually, in um, this time next week... Um, Andrew Collins is visiting us. We are meeting in the northeast uh, of the United States. We're actually going to meet in Massachusetts, and we are going to spend uh, three weeks, approximately three weeks, uh, going to sites in uh, New England, uh, underground chambers, uh, stone chambers, and so on, hopefully with the uh, uh, with the main cast of the uh, History Channel show Search for Lost Giants, uh, which was on last year. Uh, that show has not been renewed, but we are meeting up with them and going to some sites, and we are then going to go to a number of sites in New York and Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Kentucky and then back uh, into Tennessee and from Tennessee, we will go to a couple of other sites. So, yes, and how many of those sites will we see in three weeks? To some extent, uh, it depends on what we find at them. If we find some things that we really want to take some time with, and that reduces the number that we'll go to. But we did this last winter also, uh, and that actually resulted in a book, and this will probably result in, if nothing uh, else, a, uh, a film, a, a brief documentary. Uh, but more likely, it'll wind up in a book. I know Andrew's completing one on what he believes are the origins of the leaders of the uh, America's mound building culture, uh, which began roughly about, well, about 6,000 years ago. Uh, and this is part of that research for him. So that is where we're going as soon as we get, uh, as soon as the Bahamas loosen their grip on permits there, we will go back there. Uh, we do have plans on going to Cuba at some point. There's some very specific places we want to go. Cuba is open to Americans now, but the exact spots we want to go to in Cuba are not open uh, to Americans right now. So we're waiting to do that. So that's kind of our agenda over the next few months and maybe thereafter. Well, I would definitely love to have you back on, you know, when you get some more research and, and find out what it is you found. Okay. Well, I know you're going to talk to Andrew in a few weeks, and Andrew Collins, and he will um, 
he can give you a report on what his take is on uh, what we do over the next couple of weeks. That would be great, but you are very fascinating, and I have well, I have actually learned a lot in this interview. Um, That's why I do well, these I, interviews. I love to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with that, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. And take your kids to some maps. Find some local sites. Find some sites within a day of driving, and take them on a weekend trip to some maps. I definitely am going to do that, and I want to thank you so much for taking your time to be with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and hopefully we'll do it again. Oh, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. That was an absolutely phenomenal interview, you guys. Um, this guy's great, and, you know, I really, really strongly suggest that you guys get on and check him out. Um, he is great. Uh, as he said, we have Andrew Collins coming up here in a few weeks as well. And I know they work closely together. And, you know, I'm just very interested in getting both of, you know, both of their perspectives on what they found. Because this is, this stuff is unfolding and it's great having these people, you know, out there actually doing this stuff and, and being able to bring us, you know, information on what they found. I think this is phenomenal. Well, that's all we have time for today. We post all of our shows on YouTube. And if you want to know more about our guests and upcoming guests, just visit us at our Info to Rail webpage. You just Google Info to Rail and click on our Google Sites page. I want to thank you all so much for joining us here at Info to Rail. We hope to see you here each week. May God bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon.